We are about to start the sec second part of our first session. <laughs> and the next speaker is Professor Trachenberg, Manuel Trachenberg. Professor, whom I guess you all know, Professor Manuel Trachenberg has been chairman of the, uh, is chairman of the, uh, old, <laughs> is chairman of the uh, University Budgeting and, and Grant Committee of the Council of Higher Education in Israel since uh, September 2009, after having served first as the head of the uh, National Economy, Economic Council at the uh, Prime Minister Office and Chief Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister during 2006 till 2009. In August 2011, he was appointed a head of the uh, Government uh, Committee for Social and Economic uh, Change, following the mass, uh, as you all remember, the Israelis among us remember, the protest of the uh, summer of 2011. And, uh, and as some of us remember, he issued a very tall uh, report, which undoubtedly was not completely realized. Uh, coming back to the uh, academic uh, background, Professor Trachtenberg has been professor of economics at Tel Aviv University since 1984, obtained his PhD at Harvard, and the, um, where he held also visiting positions, both at Harvard and Stanford in universities. And he is a research associate of the NBER in Cambridge, USA, and of the uh, CEPR in London, UK, and was a fellow of the Canadian Institute of um, Advanced Research. And uh, Sorry. His main research interests are in economics of innovation, patents, industrial organization, R&D policy, growth, and uh, development uh, uh, policies as well. Professor Trachtenberg served as head of the science uh, and technology program at the Neiman Institute, which. Uh, we heard about this uh, earlier from Zev uh, as Technion and as a consultant for the uh, World uh, Bank on R&D and Innovation Policies for Development. Uh, Professor Strathberg published many books and uh, was awarded many honors and uh, awards, which I'm not going to count right now, and learning from his impressive CV, it, it makes him an excellent uh, speaker for the topics of today. Manuel, please. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Yaakov. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, addressing such a distinguished audience on a topic uh, that uh, uh, has a, a prominent importance uh, for us now in higher education policy. So um, I'm looking forward to your comments and insights that uh, I hope will have an influence in shaping our policies. So um, I would like to describe to you uh, the program uh, that we have launched a couple of years ago that is called the ICOR program, the Israeli Centers of uh, Research Excellence. Um, but before I do that, I want to give you some background. Uh, I understand that some of it was provided uh, earlier, but nevertheless, some background of where does the higher education system stand now uh, uh, and in contrast to the past and what's needed to go further and improve it? So roughly speaking, um, as you already know, the higher education system in Israel, when I say higher education system, I mean a, a everything that encompasses academia and basic research. As you know, in Israel, we don't have basic research done outside of academia uh, at all. Essentially, all of 
the basic research in Israel is conducted within academia, which is kind of unusual in other countries. There are institutes, etc. This is all within uh, academic institutions. So um, essentially, we develop in Israel a, a, a very strong and vibrant academic uh, system throughout the years, going back for close to 100 years. Uh, you know, we will celebrate the, in a few years the, the 100 years of establishment of the Technion and the Hebrew University and so forth. And uh, we develop um, in an almost miraculous way, I must say, a, a really standards of excellence in research against all odds. But it happened, and it took root. And after the creation of the state, more universities were added, and they continue in that tradition. But when you look at the situation in the 1980s, what you see is, on the one hand, these universities, seven of them, strong, vibrant, uh, with standards of excellence, uh, well-rooted uh, in the institutions. And on the other hand, a, a big chunk of the population that didn't have access to higher education at that point. And that tension uh, resulted in the creation of colleges. Uh, the colleges, part of them funded by the government, part of them private, that develop over time. And uh, if, if you take a snapshot of the situation right now, we have 67 uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, including uh, the universities, colleges, private colleges, teaching teachers' colleges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The number of students shoot up from something like 70,000, slightly over 20 years ago, to over 300,000 right now. So there was a very rapid growth of the system from the early 90s throughout the past two decades. <coughs> Very rapid growth, both in terms of numbers of students and in terms of number of institutions throughout the country. That quantitative expansion came at a price. And the price we paid was that essentially quality suffered. And it suffered because the budgets didn't keep up with the quantitative growth. And not only the, at the beginning they were growing, uh, more or less synchronized with the growth in the numbers of students. But in the, in the, in the uh, decade starting in 2000, okay, throughout the decade, the budgets actually declined at some point in nominal terms, so for sure in real terms. And so you have the conjunction of two processes. On the one hand, the number of students and institutions growing. On the other hand, the budgets available to the system uh, were declining. Now, the universities, which are in Israel the only institutions that are supposed to and do basic research, and at that point we had seven of them, the universities suffered the most. Why? Because the colleges kept growing in terms of number of students. So there was a shift of the budget from the universities that were stagnant in terms of number of students to the colleges that kept growing in quantities. Okay? The result of that was uh, really quite dramatic for the university system. And we see that very clearly in terms of the faculty, the senior faculty. The number of senior faculty in the universities at the universities declined in absolute terms from a high of about 4,600, uh, something like 10, 10 years ago, to 4,200, 300 approximately uh, these days. It declined in absolute terms, okay, at the same time as you know, colleges were growing, et cetera, et cetera. Not only that, but the average <coughs> age of the senior faculty of course, grew up because you know you were not replacing the, the way that the numbers were shrinking of faculty was by retirement, and those positions were not filled with new recruits. A very uh, painful consequence 
of what I just described is brain drain. Okay, so the system kept producing top-notch students, PhDs, etc. They didn't find uh, a place within the system. They went abroad, and by the way, the tradition for Israeli scholars is that you either do a PhD abroad in a top university and then you come back and join the faculty, and or, depending what field you study, you do, you may do your PhD here, but you go for a postdoc, at least one, if not two, in one of the best academic institutions abroad, in particular in the US. So many youngsters uh, found themselves there, either finishing a PhD or finishing a postdoc and a second postdoc without opportunities to come back. So they stay there. And we have statistics about that that are really very, very worrisome. And in fact, here in the uh, National Academy of Sciences, they have collected, I don't know where you mentioned that before, but they have collected the data uh, on Israelis abroad. And I want to praise the Academy for, for, for doing that. And we have now a list that is almost by definition not comprehensive, but it's as comprehensive as you can get uh, of uh, Israelis uh, uh, currently abroad in academic institutions. And if you look at these numbers, approximately one quarter, 25% of all Israeli scientists are abroad. One quarter. I mean, this is dramatic. The country that comes next is Canada with, with 12%. So uh, brain drain here really has a very potent and dramatic manifestation. So um, one um, uh, manifestation of the problem is, as I said, the brain drain. Another one was the, the deterioration of the research infrastructure. You know, there are certain things that you do by default. If you don't replace the latest uh, microscope, well, you know, it deteriorates gradually. It doesn't collapse overnight, so you can keep going but the quality of the training you can do and of the research you can do, of course, declines accordingly. So there was a deterioration of research and teaching uh, infrastructure, and so forth and so on. Uh, when I say so forth and so on, among other things, what happens in a situation like that is that the arena of a higher education becomes essentially a boxing ring, because you know everybody's concerned about their own budget, okay, and it's a zero-sum game. So it's free for all, you know, colleges against universities, senior faculty against the system, everybody against the Ministry of uh, Finance, et cetera, et cetera. And those fights, those, the, those struggles, have become in themselves a factor that is very detrimental to the functioning of the system. So um, when I arrived in the scene in, in September of 2009. That was the picture. And it was really a dismal picture, uh, very depressing, because for us in Israel, and this, is, this has to be clear here in this audience, for us in Israel, having a top-notch academic system, system is not just something which is nice to have, and it's not a luxury. It's a necessity. And it's a necessity, and we have to spell it that out, because our economy depends upon that. Our economy is based. The engines of growth of this country have been, and they are, essentially an extension of excellence in science and technology. And so our economy needs that. Social mobility requires that. Our defense depends upon that, because the only edge we can have is a qualitative edge, and so forth and so on. So for us. It's really a matter of the basics of our country that depend upon having a strong, advanced, first-class higher education system. And so it was clear that we need to do something um, uh, far-reaching in order to change the situation I, I just described. So we worked out for a few months a, a long-term plan, a multi-year plan. We secured the support of the government from the prime minister through the Ministry of Finance and so forth. We launched it in, uh, in 2010. And we set very clearly 
two goals to the plan. Not five, not ten, two goals. The first is, and it was clearly spelled out, is we said, this is it. I mean, we are not going for to continue the quantitative expansion. We are over with that. Okay, now the emphasis is on excellence. Excellence in research and excellence in teaching. So we're putting excellence first and not quantitative expansion. The reason I emphasize in this is because, you see, it's very easy to come up with slogans and to say, well, you know, we want to promote excellence. Everybody does right? want to do that. But it comes at a price. So you have to understand what the trade-offs are. And if you're serious about going for excellence, it means that something else you're not going to do. Okay? And this is kind of the ABC of economic thinking, but, you know, somehow we have to face the music, as we say. Uh, the second uh, goal that we post to ourselves is increase access to particular groups in the population that are left out, and that's the ultra-Orthodox population in Israel and some of the minorities of the Arab population. So these are very targeted groups that we want to integrate, to bring into the fall of higher education, and that requires particular treatment. So these are the two goals. All right, so how do you do that? Well, as I said, we secure a significant budget increase that will amount to 30% real over five years, essentially, because the first year was just the drawing of the plan. And we are in the middle of, the, uh, of that plan and budget, and I'm happy to report that we have survived last week. And last week was when the budget for the next year and a half was passed in the government. It still has to go through parliament, through the Knesset. But we survived that, meaning you know that there is a cut, but uh, it's really not very significant, although I must warn you that there was a cut. So for to the Israeli side, I said, don't go out and celebrate. But, but you know, we survived that. So anyway, we are on track, OK? Uh, and that's important. Now, that's just the beginning. To have a budget increase is only part, and in many ways, a small part of what you need. You need to reorient the system towards excellence and away from the previous ways that the system was uh, acting. So uh, we undertook a series of measures, starting from a change in the budgeting model. I will not describe that. Uh, we, we designed, we earmark budgets for the renewal of research infrastructure and teaching infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. More importantly, we put a lot of emphasis on the recruitment of new faculty. Because in the end, in the end, it's people. And that's kind of the main thing. Either you manage to bring back that tremendous potential of young, brilliant scientists, Israeli scientists abroad, or you're doomed. Because you, know, the, you can put as much money you want into buildings and laboratories, but in the end, it's people. So we. I'm not going to describe how we change the budgeting model in a way that gives a strong incentives, strong incentives to institutions to hire new faculty, new senior faculty, not adjunct faculty. That was also a problem. So that was kind of a main, uh, a main line of action. But it was clear to us that we have to go further than that. And you have to go further than that both in order to really make sure that excellence becomes a top priority. But also, you need to do something which is symbolic, that has symbolic value, that has salience in public discourse, that people can relate to it, that the government can relate to it, that the press can relate to it. So we needed something else. And the something else came in the form of the Israeli Centers of Research Excellence, and I must tell you that this managed to capture the attention of the government. And when I say that, you know, a small anecdote is that when I came to the government um, to, to talk about this early on in the game, uh, I was given a window of half an hour. But, you know, the, 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 I've been there, so I knew how things work, so I asked to be first in, the, in, the, in that government <laughs> meeting. 
And uh, the government meetings here start at 10 o'clock, uh, depending who is the prime minister, but <laughs> typically start at 10 o'clock. And I was first, and I was giving, given half an hour, and the discussion went on for three and a half hours, and they canceled the rest of the agenda for that day. And that was decisive. Let me tell you, if that would have not happened, we wouldn't be talking today about this. Because you need to get the attention of the people that are going to make the decisions that will affect this in the end, okay? And it got then repercussions in the press and so forth and so on. Anyway, so let me go now deep in and into what is this program. So first of all, what are the goals of the program? Um, first of all, yes, to strengthen cutting edge scientific research in Israel, but we are doing that in selected areas. We have to recognize we are a small country, and sometimes we have pretensions of being re really very big, but we are a small country. There, is, there are so many researchers here, so you have to be very careful at aspiring your aspirations to understand that you will have to focus on selected areas, and I will go into how you do that, which is a key question, of course. Second, I said that brain game. Okay, so to bring back and retain, and retain, because that's also an issue, uh, outstanding researchers, um, and we'll see how we we'll serve that purpose. Then we need to create critical mass. Critical, if there is one big problem right now in Israel, is the lack of critical mass in specific fields at specific <coughs> institutions. You have, in many fields, a critical ma mass nationwide. But at specific institutions, okay, in many areas, we don't. And in some areas, we are well below critical mass. And we live in an era that individuals, individuals of course, make a, dif a difference and can make huge contributions. But you need to have the surrounding academic environment that will, over time, do, do the job and not just you know, uh, individuals. And that's true for researchers, and it's true for infrastructure. And we need to strengthen comparative advantage. Again, you know, that has to do with what I said before, the issue of selected areas. Then there is, you know, we want to promote no, not more of the same, but innovative multidisciplinary research. This is a much abused concept, multidisciplinary. But it's clear that we live in an era that at MIT they call it convergence or whatever. But there is really a different they say the game has changed in, 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 the, in the cutting edge fields in science. And what it once was, just a slogan these days, is more and more a reality. And we have to recognize that the university system as it is now, at least here in Israel, in many ways has become an impediment to good research because of the you know, divisions by faculty, et cetera, et cetera, that not necessarily contribute to the convergence that uh, uh, we see happening. And we want to encourage cooperation between academic institutions in Israel. Now, for those of you that come from abroad, you have to understand that in, in Israel, geography is very peculiar. The distance between Tel Aviv and Boston in Israel is shorter than the distance between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. <laughs> This is a quirk of geography in Israel, but that's the way it is. For academia, it is like that. I mean, people are much more ready to travel from Tel Aviv to Boston or to travel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem or vice versa. So this has been for, this has been for a long time a big <coughs> issue here that researchers in Israel, I'm of course exaggerating it, but you know, they, for the most part, they have very good collaborations, important collaborations abroad, but they tend to be reluctant to have collaborations within uh, Israel. So these are the main goals of the program. So mind you, uh, pay attention to the fact that excellence here, the word excellence, doesn't appear. It's implied, but it's not something, you know, if, if you just say, well, I want to establish a center of research for excellence. Uh, yes, uh, we all want so. So here we are talking about goals that can have practical implications in the way you design these centers. Okay, each one of, 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 of these uh, items, okay, 
were translated into practical implications. Okay, so those were the goals, and I'm going to, at the end of the talk, I told to go back to that and see what the dilemmas are when you try to implement those goals. So how does it work, the ICOR program? Well, first of all, in terms of budget, we um, came up with a budget of $370 million over five years, uh, three-way financing, government, the institutions themselves that will be recipients of, of these centers, and we hope that we, we hoped at the time that we uh, were would able to recruit also uh, to gather philanthropy, you know, contributions, etc. I must tell you that we failed, okay? We failed on that, and there are many reasons for that, and this is also an interesting uh, issue to consider. To what extent, when you go for national programs, to what extent you can aim at or try to rely also on philanthropy in a way competing with the, each individual institution that does that big time. So this was a sobering lesson, okay? And uh, as a result of that, the budget was reduced, okay? Because now we have only two partners, so it's two thirds of what we intended it to be, okay? So we started from a high mark, and then we had to adjust as we realized that we failed um, in that attempt. In April of 2010, the, the government undertook the decision because it was really a, a big time money for Israel. You know, the, you have to be, you have to put this in perspective. $125 million doesn't sound like much, uh, and it isn't much. But in fact, for us, uh, that's kind of a significant delta, okay, in a particular way it's earmarked for such a purpose. The principles of action were clear. We were going to do a competitive process, bidding, et cetera, uh, and everything will be reviewed by uh, international committees. Uh, we do that systematically. I mean, the, the Israeli, um, the ISF, the, the Israeli Science Foundation does that, and et cetera, et cetera, and we partner with the Israeli Science Foundation for this purpose that was also very important. We did a, a, a first round uh, fast, a fast track, in order to show that this was feasible, to learn from it, okay, uh, before we embark in a big move. And the first, four, uh, the first four centers opened in October 2011. So from April 2010 through October 2011, we did a very fast pro process by these standards, you know, meaning we elicited the bidding, okay, and uh, there was an uh, international refereeing, et cetera, et cetera, and they started in October 2011. Then we proceeded to do a second round, and then we did a bottom-up process to, to come up with the research areas that deserve to, be, to become research centers, uh, and I will describe that in a moment, and I'm pleased to announced here that uh, this is already known to the Israelis in the audience that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, when was it uh, that we announced it? Uh, yes, so really two, two or three weeks ago, <laughs> seems to me that uh, it's a long time, we announced the second wave of 12 new research centers within the ICO, okay? So this is what we have been uh, doing. Now, one of the key things is to attract uh, talent, new recruits, excellent young researchers. So the centers offer them terms that are unusual for by Israeli standards. If you go to the US, etc., you know, this is not unusual, but again, it's relative to us. So of course, each of them gets a tenure track in an academic institution. They get a research grant of $100,000, depending on the field, per year for five years assured, so they don't have to spend uh, one-fifth of the time writing research proposals with high uncertainty. They get a startup grant for equipment, depending on the field, again, of uh, over half a million uh, dollars. And of course, they get to work with a group, that's the critical mass part of it, with a group of uh, excellent uh, researchers. The way we manage the program is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, there is this partnership between us at the, at the Council of Higher Education and the ISF, and this was crucial because the ISF brought with it to the partnership 
the, the experience and the credibility of the refereeing process, which is essential. I mean, if you, if you do a bidding and you don't know how to manage the refereeing process, the review process, you are doomed. And, uh, and we establish a monitoring team, a steering committee, and a scientific, international scientific advisory committee. I won't expand too much, but the, this was also very important. The scientific advisory committee, the international committee, includes really prominent figures. There are something like five Nobel Prizes here or something like that. Um, the number keeps changing <laughs> as they get. Uh, so it's a very prominent uh, gallery of, of uh, scientists. Uh, they help us a lot in terms of getting people to referee, you know, prominent scientists abroad to referee and to do the review of the proposals, et cetera, because otherwise you don't have access. The, the steering committee is headed by uh, Shimon Yankilevich, who is here. Um, and again, it consists of people from all disciplines uh, that uh, help us a lot in, in the process. Now, how does it work? So each i each center, consists of a collaboration, a grouping of researchers from various institutions. It can be two, three, four universities. Here is just two, OK? It could, they could be also as individual researchers from colleges and from research hospitals, OK? So it's a grouping of researchers that submit a, a joint proposal okay, in a particular area. And the, um, and the proposal may include, uh, of course, the actual research they're going to do, the uh, infrastructure that they need, the equipment they need for that purpose, um, the recruitment of uh, PhD students, postdocs, uh, conferences, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a bunch of activities that they are allowed to do, and the program is to last for five years. Okay, that's the length of the program. And we were very pick, uh, picky about new recruits. There was a minimum, there is a minimum of new recruits that they have to bring in in order to qualify for this program. Because as I said, part of the goal, one of the goals was to reverse the brain drain and bring back Israelis uh, here. The first four i cores <clears throat> were those listed here, one in life sciences, in energy, brain research, computer science. Were, when I say it in those fields, these were very specific research proposals, not just in life sciences, okay? But I'm not detailing them. These, these are the scientific directors. Those are the institutions um, that are associated with each. So the, the smallest or the fewer institutions were three like in this one, the Technion, Weizmann, Ben Gurion University, here, Tel Aviv, Weizmann, and Hebrew, and the other two had more institutions or researchers from many other institutions uh, also. Um, the way we, because we wanted to do a fast track, uh, then what we did in order to elicit the, the fields in which these research uh, institutes uh, were founded, uh, we ask from the presidents of the universities for proposals, okay? Or for suggestions for fields. We essentially, um, the steering committee chose the, the most common fields among the, the, those proposed, and they were quite obvious, so it was not much, a, a, you know, they were not hard decisions to be made, and we launched this form. Um, already, uh, 18 top young researchers have been recruited, uh, coming from the best institutions abroad, five from Harvard, two from Princeton, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they were recruited by those institutions. These are really, I mean, if there is, you know, sometimes you have moments of satisfaction when you do this hard work. And meeting these uh, youngsters is really, is really very heartwarming. Because you, you, you see, I mean, the tremendous talent and they came back uh, due to this initiative. And many more will be recruited, but this is kind of you know, the first uh, phase. Aside from the research in itself that they are doing, uh, other things have happened. For example, with, with what we see that is happening, and that's very nice, is that the i has turned into a brand. And so you know, this is a gradual process. So for example, 
the Italian government approached us in order to send, they will, they fi they will finance, actually they started already, right, Delia? They are financing 17 postdoctoral fellows to come to our ICOs, okay? And this was a, an initiative of the Italian government. I mean, somehow word got around about the centers. Same happened with the, the Czech Republic. The, our prime minister uh, went to, visit, to a visit uh, there. The prime minister of, uh, uh, of the Czech Republic approached our prime minister and asked him to facilitate the uh, establishing research fellowships uh, for them. Again, it's their financing, it's not ours. Okay, they're doing that. Uh, and there are other cooperations. So that's important to say because you, you, you need these platforms that will go beyond the individual institution in Israel in order to foster collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. Again, purchase of advanced research equipment for some of these centers, which would have been very hard to do for each individual institution. They are doing that. And we are starting to see, we are starting to see, I'm saying this very careful, carefully, collaborations between researchers in different institutions in Israel. And you know, they tell us the stories where we are actually now uh, uh, taking good note <coughs> of that because um, they are telling us, you know, of meetings between labs in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv that never happened before, and new ideas emerge, and so forth and so on. So slowly, the distances in Israel are shrinking to its natural proportions. Uh, and there is a strong interest among Israeli researchers abroad on that. When now we go abroad and we meet uh, these youngsters, these Israeli youngsters, this has become a focal point of discussion, this ICOS. Okay, so it has become or is becoming a significant there. Now the second wave, this is interesting as a process, we've never done this before. What we did is we issued a, an open call to all Israeli researchers, whether they are here in Israel or abroad, for them to suggest which areas, in their opinion, deserve to become an ICOR center, okay? And we, of course, we, we describe what the ICOR is and what are the parameters, et cetera. And we <coughs> say that uh, at least three researchers should sign, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we receive, I mean, over uh, 1,200 researchers participated in this process. I don't know of any other process previously done in academia that where so many uh, responded to that. And the, 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 these researchers come from 150 institutions, uh, both in Israel and abroad, uh, dozens of them from abroad that wanted to participate in the process. And in the end, when, you, when we filter it through, okay, with several filters, we ended up with 160 proposals for research areas, not for the centers themselves. In the end, 18 were chosen, in, again, in a process that involved a lot of refereeing and reviews, et cetera, et cetera. And we launched, a, th those were the, the fields, the areas chosen. And in the end, uh, we issued a call for proposals to establish research centers within each of these areas, okay? So it was a, a two-fold uh, process. In the end, well, in the second way, we improve the format the, of, the, of the program. I want to, aside from the variety of areas, I want to already to, to point out to this issue. We had all the time a significant and tough dilemma as to whether emphasize the fact that the institutions participate in this kind of consortia or researchers coming from different institutions that group themselves to, together, but the institution that they come from doesn't play a significant role. So is it to be institution-based as a collaboration or researcher-based? And we agonized over this. In the first wave, there was a bit more of an emphasis on institutions that had some manifestation. In the second wave, we downgraded the emphasis on institutions and more on uh, research. Uh, so the 12 new centers are those listed here. For the first time, there were centers in social sciences and the humanities. 
I must remark, it's very interesting. Um, it was not easy to get the humanities to participate in this process. Because essentially, there is no tradition of getting these big research grants in the humanities, less so in collaborative ways. And the humanities, typically, they each a, a researcher is on his or her own, OK? And it's a different, really, research culture compared to the exact sciences or the, or the life sciences, OK? So there was a change here, very interesting, to elicit these proposals. And there were, there was a lot of back and forth uh, uh, with them. There was also some of that with social sciences, but it, wasn't, it was less problematic. But you know, the, in the end, the topics in the social sciences are not what you would have expected, in part because also there it was not easy to get them to get these collaborations and submit uh, uh, the proposals. So this is kind of the end of, a, of, of the process of establishing the, the i course. So right now, there are 16 such centers. And this is the end of the line. I mean, we, we don't have additional budget to keep going. Uh, so now it's a matter of operating them, et cetera, following them up, and so forth. I, I want to, I, I won't go through the names. I want to um, uh, go through the dilemmas, because I think that this is what's interesting, OK? In light of the experience we, uh, uh, we accumulated. So I said before, the first goal uh, is to strengthen the cutting edge scientific research aiming at world leadership in selected areas. OK. But then the dilemma that we faced was, all right, but do you select on existing strength? You go for sure bets, or you also try to uh, go for potential excellence for needed areas. What does it mean, needed areas okay, of national interest or something like that? For the most part, this was not an issue, but in two or three occasions, this became a big issue. And I won't say which areas so as not to elicit any associations here, but there was one particular area in which there was a clear strength in a more theoretical approach very strong, world class. And on the other hand, on more applied stuff, there was, we were not up to world standards, but there was a strong, according to the people in the field, there's a strong need for that. So what do you do? OK, if you go strictly for existing excellence, it was very clear, OK? So this, in two or three occasions, this became a big dilemma. And of course, there are no clear cut answers to that. But this is something that you have to consider to ponder when you go for a program like this. The second one is brain gain. So yes, bring back uh, outstanding young researchers. Yes, but what you do about senior researchers that are already here? So you can imagine what that means, OK? Um, you know, we are really very normative people and eth ethical, but envy is also part of our human nature. And envy uh, has practical implications when you get offers from other places, et cetera, et cetera. So again, not easy to handle you know, the hiring of new talent and giving, as I described before, kind of very generous uh, recruiting uh, offers to them what you do with the existing senior faculty. Then I said create critical mass, encourage research cooperation, et cetera. But I said that before, I, I, I mentioned this before, what's the role of institutions versus researchers? Critical mass, where? And let me elaborate on that for the moment. So suppose you establish a center, OK, in a particular field, and you manage need to collect uh, a bunch of very good researchers in that center. But that center is not a brick and mortar, OK? They are, each of them is in their own institution. OK? So does it really mean that you have achieved critical mass if they don't belong to the same institution? What will happen after five years? OK? So perhaps you should make sure that that happens in one or two institutions, and they get together. So again, 
where to put the emphasis on institutions or on researchers. The, just to expand a bit more on that, each of us as a researcher, we know what the answer is for us. Okay, I don't care about the, sorry, I care. But <laughs> what I care is about my research, right? So if I read research can be augmented by you know, having another researcher elsewhere that will join forces and get money, great. But you know, don't, don't talk about my institution as doing this or that. I want my area of research to do this or that. So the individual researcher, for him or her, the answer is very clear. But when you look at it system-wide, the answer is less clear. So this is something that, again, we, we took a position, a stand on that. We changed it slightly in the second round. But to this day, believe me, I'm not sure whether what we did is right, OK, or how to fine tune it if I had the opportunity uh, uh, to do that. Further challenges, uh, you know, the new i we announced them, but then now they have to start operating. Um, uh, you know, reaching the goals is not that easy. Monitoring and assessment is extremely important. We want, we are doing it. We want to do it in real time, okay, to, to, you know, to learn from that. Uh, we want to strengthen the, the brand. And then there's the question, what happens after five years? Okay, do you close shop and say, thank you very much, very nice, okay? Well, what, at least my uh, suggestion is that we should, in a couple of years from now, midway <coughs> along the way, we should announce, if we have the resources for that, that say one third of, the, of, the, of these centers will have a second round, but it will be the one third that proves themselves worthy of that according to the goals that we have set and perhaps additional criteria that we develop over the years. You need to have an horizon. It, by no means, I don't think that everybody should get it automatically. Some of them will do well, some will fail. This is an experiment. Okay, that's the nature of the scientific enterprise. Okay, and perhaps the second <coughs> round, if it comes along, will have a different nature. For example, I hope that the need to emphasize recruiting will be less so because I hope that from now on we'll be recruiting many people. So what I'm saying is that you need an horizon. It has to be very competitive. And the system has to have the flexibility to learn from itself and move along. Thank you very much. Sorry, two, two short questions. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. First one, one of the, you mentioned brain drain. One of the things we suffer from is internal brain drain. I mean, brain drain to other disciplines. You mentioned, for instance, the Simon Center. There's also a company funded by the same Simons who has attracted a lot of scientists left science to, to work on finance. And so do you have this problem in Israel? We have it. Uh, the, the second question is, you alluded to, uh, I sit in, a, in the science uh, advisory committee together with David Gorse of uh, Institute of Physics of the Chinese Academy in Beijing. And they have something called the Thousand Talents Program, uh, which give a lot of money for, Chinese coming back and uh, apartments and things <coughs> like that. It has led to nearly an explosion of the institute because uh, more senior researchers, which did not benefit from this, were extraordinarily unhappy. So right. how do you deal with that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with respect to the first question, the internal brain drain, we have some of that in certain fields of engineering and computer sciences that they go to the high-tech industry and some of the defense industry that is very sophisticated. Uh, it's very hard for me to, uh, I, I don't have uh, numbers of that. We know that there is an actual, Yakov may expand on that, at the Technion, which is the preeminent uh, 
Institute of Engineering and Related Sciences in Israel, um, we have problems uh, recruiting, or they have problems recruiting faculty in certain engineering branches. There is a lack of faculty, okay, in some uh, branches of engineering. So that's an issue. Um, of course, there is a talent that goes, this channel towards the high tech sector early on. You know, I, each of us has some anecdote of a youngster, you know, my, one of my daughters, you know, she, she's doing now a graduate degree in physics and she said, you know, what am I doing? You know, I could get, be getting this much money in the high tech sector and she kept, keeps getting offers. I don't know what will happen to her. So, you know, the, there is clearly a pool there, but it's very hard to assess the, the, the magnitude of it. My impression, but this is totally casual impression, and it's not based on data, is that this is not a very serious issue, okay? That there is a selection early on, and some people want to do basic research and will go into it, and will kind of be able to withstand the temptation of, of, of rapid gains in, in the salaries, et cetera, but this is really just an impression. Um, the second question about, I mentioned that. I know about this program in, in China. I, I, I went to China recently in a, in a mission and they mentioned that. Um, by the way, it's not clear that it's a very successful program because the emphasis there, no, not only because of what you said, but the emphasis there is buying talent. Okay, buying talent. Okay, you know, they give a lot of money to this Chinese, excellent Chinese research coming from abroad. What you need is much more than that. You know, as I said, you, know, you need to create an environment that it goes far beyond the, the material rewards that you get right on, okay? The critical mass, et cetera. For example, if you were to say, suppose that you take the same amount of money we are giving to these research centers and, and spread them, okay? Say, you know, bring yeah, bright Israelis from abroad in, in whatever field you want. I think that the effect will be very different because you know, if you spread it thin, okay, then you don't get critical mass, you, you don't necessarily get the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So there is that. The issue of what happens with the senior faculty that are um, contemplating these youngsters coming, you know, this is something that uh, uh, I don't have a, a good answer to that. Luckily for us, we don't have that much money. So <laughs> the, 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 the gap is not that big. <laughs> But I don't have a good answer to that. No, no, no. It's important to say that uh, Israelis coming back do not look for the salary. They, they look for the laboratory that they will have. Also for the salary. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the main, the main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I was very much impressed by the uh, down-to-earth and uh, uh, efficient program you have set up. But uh, uh, one question or one remark I want to make has been said already. I think a, a brain drain to industry is welcome. That's why we train people. But uh, to continue that, rather I want to ask, do you have any programs or any other measures to enhance technology transfer from basic science to industry. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I don't know whether you talked about that or are going to talk about that here, but in Israel we have a relatively long tradition at the universities of technology transfer offices and conditions which are actually quite good, quite good, first of all in terms of results. You know, you, we, 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 have, we have had great successes um, our, the president of the academy here uh, is the foremost person in that respect. She can tell us more about that. But uh, um, essentially, we didn't have the problems that the U.S. had that required the change in the law, the Bay Doll Act of 1980 and 1984, that allow for essentially transfer of technology. We had that much before, okay? And the system works. Now, does it work 
well enough? No. Uh, there are issues, outstanding issues, that we are trying to resolve. We are um, discussing these issues with the Ministry of Trade and Industry because, the, just to give you an example of the issues, okay? Suppose that uh, you make uh, some innovation at the university and then you take it out and found a startup company, okay, with it, okay? And yes, you are going to give uh, some of royalties to the university according to a contract, etc. But what happens if that startup receives later on support from the government to continue doing R&D, okay, but this is applied R&D, commercial R&D, okay, and you get improved innovations that come out from that. Who owns the intellectual property for that? So that has become a significant issue of contention here, and we are trying to improve on that. That's one. The second part has to do with the attitude of industry. In Israel, industry has an attitude that is really one of picking the low-hanging fruit. So they say, yeah, you know, fantastic. You know, we have great academia here. Aha. Uh -huh. So here there is something to pick. Okay, let's do it. They don't realize that in order to have a successful partnership, the industry itself has to do serious research on its own because that's the only way that you can have mutual benefits over time. That's one. And B, that industry will have to support directly a, a, a research at the universities without expecting necessarily that the next day they will have a patent and innovation and rents coming out from it. And this is a sort of cultural attitude that has to change. We are not yet there. I mean, we are in the process, but we are not there yet. Yeah, if I may, a very important issue was raised uh, here about the interfacing and transfer of technological IP from the academic research to industry. So first, as someone who came from the world of basic research, the major goal of the university is to produce new fascinating knowledge. And we have to be very, very careful in operations. However, in the real world, one has to find a way for transfer of intellectual property and results of research to industry. And here, the Israeli Academy, under the leadership of Yankov, our chairman, has been very active. <coughs> when Zev Tadmor showed in the cornerstone of the system, a Hebrew word, talent, which means national infrastructure for research. This is a voluntary body established by Yaakov and shared for by him, and now it's being shared by Ruth Yannon, for build up of infrastructure with the participation of the University Grants Committee with the chief scientist of industry and with other central bodies on the research. Some of the very impressive results of this activity has been first the participation of Israel as a member in the ESRF and then the Israeli industry was introduced into providing equipment uh, to scientific activity, then internet too. And the third example is the nanotechnology project, which operates on two levels. One is build up of advanced infrastructure, which includes as the very beautiful hyper program reversing the brain drain. And the second element <coughs> pertains to focal technological areas which are conducted, it's a research in the universities, but mission oriented research. So this is in a way a change in the research structure and culture of 
the university system. And such a balancing is extremely important and significant. In addition to that, I think that uh, each university in Israel has a technology transfer company that is responsible, first of all, to patent all uh, inventions that are worth patenting, because usually if you don't patent, nothing can come out of it, because no one will, de will undertake development of a product, any product, if it does not have a patent protection. So this is their first role. The second role is uh, to uh, either license it or form joint venture with industry so that uh, this uh, invention can be, uh, can be developed. And I think that during the years, a, a, a very fruitful relationship has been built between the universities, all the universities in Israel, and, uh, uh, very, uh, and parts of the industry uh, in Israel and abroad, mostly in Israel, mostly in Israel, uh, to the benefit of everybody. Let me conclude by remarking that there is a certain advantage of being small. And after all, transfer means one person to another one. And the fact that they are small and everybody knows each other helps a lot in actually transferring knowledge in Israel, either formally or informally. Usually it's informal. Be small and say Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.